Hey, welcome back to Way of the Wrench. And on today's very special episode, I'm going to be showing you how to install a secondary power supply, a step down voltage regulator, some terminal blocks, a very cool pulse width modulated fan board. And all of that stuff is going to help us have the buttons lit up at the front of our cabinet, have some nice cooling air going in through the cabinet, and we'll have 12 volt power for any kind of future toys down the road, such as surround sound feedback. So much goodness. Let's get into it. So once again, I've got a whole bunch of components that I have to start putting inside this cabinet. Now, rather than just start putting it all over the inside of the cabinet, I'd like to have it look nice and neat and organized and have a rhyme and reason to where I've put it. So when I put the KL25Z board, I made a nice shelf. I think I'm going to do the same exact thing, probably put it behind the sub box this time. And the first step is to lay out all the parts where they're going to go. So you have a rough idea of what you're making. So let's take a quick look at that. All right. So what I'm thinking about this shelf is that this will be a power distribution center, meaning that any power comes and going to devices is going to go to this shelf first. And the reason why is that with these terminal strips, I can kind of organize what voltages are and that limits the amount of wires needed in the cabinet. Now I only need one line from the power supply to a block and then each of the devices that needs that voltage can have a line coming off of here. Now, I was kind of thinking that this could be zero volts. So this could be our common and our grounds block. This could be five volts for things like LEDs, uh, addressable LEDs, things like that. This one will be 6.3, a little stepped out voltage or step down from 12 volts with this step down regulator. This is going to be for some of the buttons like the coin door and the launch button. And then this one here is going to be 12 volts. And since this uh, pulse width modulator fan board operates off 12 volts, I figured I would mount it there as well. And then I'm kind of left with this empty space. Now you could use that for extra uh, 24 volts and even 48 volt power distribution blocks, or I might use it for, I've got a, an LED whiz that I will show in a future video. And I've also got my octo coupler board and a teensy for doing our addressable LED strips for future. So I'm kind of thinking that's the rough layout. So now we just have to make another shelf like we did in the other video. Now this is roughly six inches wide, and then I'm going to make it the width of the cab, which is 25 inches. So I feel a montage coming on. Free screw down your shelf, kind of have some forward thinking about what has to go there, what height should this be, making sure it's positioned okay so that wires aren't hitting other parts. You can fit your power supplies underneath and things like that. Now to help you hold this position and keep it level, you can cut two pieces of scrap wood the same height and you can rest them on that. And then when you're ready to screw this down, take one of your screws and push it through the hole inside on all four spots. And then you can take the shelf out and pre-drill those holes for these screws. Make sure you don't drill through the cabinet or put screws in too long so they come out the sides. 
right now, before we get too carried away and start screwing in the shelf, let's take a look at the power supplies and what options you have. First one up is a power supply from an old Xbox 360. Now you may have one kicking around, so it's gonna be free, or if you go to a thrift store, you're gonna find a bunch of these for about four or five bucks each. Really quite cheap and really quite decent. These things are 12 volts and they can do up to 16 amps for a total of about 200 watts. So lots of power on this. If you are interested in this, I did a really good video. I'll put a link above for you on how to prep the wires and get it all set up so that you have a switching or a non-switching power supply for your cabinet. Next up is a power supply from a dead laptop that you have around the house. Now these can be quite decent. In fact, this one gives up to 19 volts at five amps. Uh, it just depends, read the labels and see what they say. These ones, uh, what usually you have to do is you just clip the end off, that little barrel connector, and inside here will be two wires. Obviously, you're positive and negative. Or you can make it even easier for yourself. You can order female DC plugs, and that would click into here, and on the other end of the plug is a spot for a positive and a negative wire to attach to. So pretty easy. Uh, you probably have to see how much this can actually be capable of. If you're not doing too much in your cabinet, this might work for you. The next one up is an enclosed switching power supply. Now these are actually pretty decent and you can buy them for about $35 to $50 brand new, just depending on what their output is. The more power, more wattage, you're gonna pay a little bit more. Now you can get these in five volt, 12 volt, 24 and 48. And in fact, most cabinet makers will buy about three, four of these for the different voltages needed for the different parts inside their cabinet. Now this one happens to be five volts and I'm gonna be using this for my addressable LED light strips later. So I will save the talk about the wiring for that video in the future. However, for this video, if you need a 12 volt for your lights and for future SSF and things like that, uh, you could totally use one of these. These are a pretty good deal. Last up is an ATX power supply like you would find inside the computer. Now, because it's the same exact thing, some people might decide, well, I'm gonna tap into the 12 volt line on that one and just use the one power supply. I strongly suggest that you don't do that for a whole bunch of reasons. First one, your pinball cabinet needs every water power it's already getting just to drive the computer and your programs. So don't do that. And the other one is if we use a secondary power supply, then we don't have to worry about any kind of uh, power fluctuations from driving any 12 volt toys that are gonna interrupt the power supply to going to our computer. And if we're driving any audio equipment stuff that has been amplified, we don't see those power fluctuations in there as well. So for my build, I'm actually gonna use one of my used computer power supplies that was still going strong. And it's free for me. For you guys, if you had to buy a new one of these, you can get them for probably 35 bucks. I would highly recommend you go for a pretty decent amount, uh, probably 500 watts minimum. That way you get a lot of power. Uh, otherwise, I would suggest you go get an old PC from somebody and it's probably got a good power supply in it that we can tap into it. Now, in order to use this, there's a couple things we gotta do, so let's show you that. The reason why I'm using this ATX power supply is that it is a 12 volt and a five volt power supply and decent amount of watts, this is like 500 watts. And you can get these things up to about a thousand if you needed that much. Now, instead of cutting into these hardwired wires that are in the power supply, there's options. Uh, every time you buy one of these power supplies, you get a whole bunch of these four pin and Molex and different SATA HDD drive power connections and you never use them all. So what you do is you hang on to them and the next time you have a project like this, they come in handy. So what you can do is plug into the side here with one of these connections and then no one's gonna feel too bad if you clip the end of that off and then tap into the 12 and five volt and ground like that. Now the other thing we have to do with this is this will not turn on when you plug it in. The reason why is it needs to be switched on by something and that's usually the motherboard uh, from the computer. So I'm gonna show you a little trick to be able to do that. All right, you'll see if I plug this power supply in, fan doesn't spin, this is not making any power because it can't sense that it's in a computer. So we need to trick it into thinking there is one. So when you get to this connector where all these wires are, you're gonna look for this green wire and there's a black wire next to it, which is our common or our ground. Now, if we make a jumper wire to go between those, then it will actually turn on for us. So what you need to do is find a piece of wire and, and what I used that fit really nice and snug down in there so it doesn't feel like it wants to fall out is one of the larger paper clips. Just trim it with a pair of diagonal side cutters. Before you bend it up, put a small piece of heat shrink tubing and shrink it down on there. And then all you're gonna do is push this down into the connections for the green wire and the black wire that's next to it. 
and it'll turn on. Now that's actually pretty weird that that turned on because I didn't plug it in. So right there, that must be telling you that there is some kind of condenser or a capacitor in there that had power. This is why you don't work on TVs and stuff if you don't know what you're doing, because there was enough electricity in there still to hurt somebody. But now if I plug it in, you can see fan turns on. And if I was to check there on some red and yellow wires, uh, we would be getting five and 12 volt. Cool. Now, as for how you're going to mount this inside your cabinet, uh, remember this was inside a computer case and this is the plug for the back of the computer. So this means this is the hot air on the outlet side and then this big fan is actually the inlet side. So how you position this, you're going to want to make sure that it's the same airflow that's going through your cabinet. So I would aim this towards the back of your cabinet. Uh, and then the other sides, they don't have any kind of holes or screens. So that means those are free to put against any side of the cabinet where you have it. And then as for mounting it and securing it, you can make up some brackets pretty quick. Uh, or I bought these, they're like 50 cents each. They're just little sheet metal brackets. I'm literally going to undo a couple of the screws that hold the grill fan on and then uh, put it like that to the bottom of the cabinet. And then the other side, I might even put one on the back here against the side of the cabinet to secure it. Now, whatever screws you are going to put in here, uh, for example, I'm gonna put in a 632's machine screw here. Do not put anything that's crazy long, right? Be aware that you might be putting it into electrical components back in there. I also use these thin sheet metal brackets to mount my dedicated power supply that's going to be 5 volts for my addressable LED strips. All right, while I still have access to the bottom of the cabinet, I am going to mount my rear base shaker now. That way I'm not having to try to fit that in underneath the shelf after. With your pulse width modulated fan board and your step down voltage regular, go ahead and screw on some PCB feet or some mounting feet so that you can screw this down to the board. Now for these terminal blocks, when you buy them, they end up coming with these little kind of clips and they're kind of nicely color coded them. So you can have black for grounds or commons and red for any kind of power source. And the idea is that if you undo this cap here and undo all these screws, you can fit this in goes in between the two little metal plates like that. Tighten those up and then what you've done here is when you put in one line, every other little kind of spot on here is going to be the exact thing because it is all hooked up because of this piece that you've just installed. So go ahead and make one ground for the zero volts or common ground wires and then this is going to be for 5 volt, 6.3 volts and 12 volts. Now this seems a little skimpy because I'm only gonna have seven outputs for my 12 volt. So I may end up upgrading this to a 10 or a 12 position terminal block in the future. But for now, let's put these together. There you go, there's one done. So now just do the rest like this. Yeah, let's put them in the cab. Once you got your shelf installed, take all your parts and lay them out, make it look pretty. Think about accessibility. Can you get to where you need to? Are you gonna be putting any extra holes so that wires can come up in underneath? And have a little bit of forward thinking. So in this video, we're only gonna be really using this stuff here, but in the future, once I get DOF set up, I wanna set up this LED whiz board and the Octo Shield with a Teensy for the addressable LED strips, and they're gonna need a home somewhere. So roughly that's probably where they're gonna go. So once you have that all finalized and you like where they are, take a pencil, start marking them out. Take the pieces off, center punch, and pre-drill for the screws and start mounting your things.
cool, it's time for some wiring. Since we just put on our power supply, why don't we start with that? So from these wires here, I need one black wire to go to our zero volt or our ground common terminal block. And then I need a yellow wire to go to our 12 volt positive terminal block. Now, what end you use, it doesn't really matter as long as the color's right. Uh, you've got these rectangular four pin Molex connectors and then you got these four pin square ones. The only difference between these is that they might be coming from a separate rail, meaning a separate kind of part of the power supply. So this side might be getting a certain amount of amperage and then this has its own rail with its own supply of amperage. For us, either will probably work, but I'm gonna pick this one here. Uh, so I'm gonna basically figure out the length I need, trim off this end so I got access to the wires and then put them into our terminal box. You do only need one of these black wires, but there is two in the Volex connector. So I'm just putting it together more to just kind of keep it out from underneath and it can go there anyway. It's just an extra pathway for the electricity to go. So it's not gonna be a big deal, but you do only need one. For the step down regulator, we need a 12 volt positive wire to come in to where it says in positive. And then we also need a black wire for our ground going into where it says in negative. We will worry about the outside when we wire up the buttons. Now I drilled a hole underneath so that I could keep the wiring a little bit neater. So it's going to come in from underneath, come out, and just kind of have a little bit of wire poking out there. And in case you're wondering, I picked yellow because I'm going to keep 12 volts positive as my yellow wires. Kind of the same thing with this pulse width modulated fan board. We've got to put 12 volt for the positive and the negative. So same lines, just different board. For the output for the step down voltage regulator, we're going to have the out positive coming out underneath and coming to this block. So this is going to be our 6.3 volt terminal block. And then the out ground is a ground common, so it's going to go back to here as well. Now as for the color of the wire you use for your 6.3 positive voltage, it doesn't really matter, but stay away from black and yellow and red because those are your other voltages. And really there is AC in this cabinet, so you really wouldn't want to use green or white, but I'm using this four kind of wire spool that I have laying around in the shop with a 16 gauge wire and there's a brown that's um, not being used so I'm going to use brown for my 6.3 and remember when this is all done and painted I'm going to be labeling everything anyway so we'll know that the brown is for the 6.3 volts.
Before we do the button lamp wiring, why don't we plug in our power supply so I can show you that step down regulator and how it works. All right, once you've plugged it in, there should be a little red light down there that's glowing and it'll either be on in or out. Now to be able to change it, it's this little micro switch button here. You can push that to change it. But for right now, in, it's showing that there is 12.1 or three fluctuating uh, voltage coming in. And then to figure out what's coming out, you just click it so the light changes. Now it's saying 6.3. Now to adjust this, there is a little screw here. Get your, your jewelry screwdriver out and put it in there. And as you go one way or the other direction, you can see that we can scale that to whatever we want. And remember, we're coming in from 12 volts. So we're gonna put this to 6.3 volts or as close as you can get it anyway. Something like that. Perfect. And if you're a lot like me and you don't trust technology, you can always get a $15 multimeter and take your black probe, put it on the out negative, put the red probe on the positive, and it should be very close. Now it could be off a little bit. It's probably just the resistance of the wires but that's close enough for me. All right, let's power it off and start wiring up our buttons. Now, the only thing that's using 6.3 volts in my cabinet are the 555 incandescent light bulbs that are inside the coin door returns and the launch ball button. So what I need to do is I need to have a black wire coming from the ground terminal block up to the front of the cab. And then I'm going to once again, daisy chain from the coin door harness for the bulbs in the coin returns to the launch ball button. If you're not sure what I mean by daisy chaining, I'll post a link above to the video I did previous so you can learn how to do that. And then I also need a brown positive 6.3 volt to come up to the front and once again, daisy chain. So the only other thing we're gonna talk about is fuses. So I'm gonna give you a quick rundown on how electricity works and why fuses are important. So for any kind of circuit that you make, you need to have four things. First one is a source. Where are you getting electricity from? In our case, it's our power supply. Next one is a path. We need a path for that electricity to flow through our circuit, and that in our case is wires. Okay, third thing is a load. So this is the thing that does something for you. So a speaker, a heater, or in our case, it's the light bulbs on the end of our buttons. And then the last thing is a control. In most cases, it's a switch of some sort. And because we turn the cabinet on and these are gonna be hardwired to light up all the time, the switch is technically on the back of the cabinet. Now, when you have a load in a circuit, that load uses all of the electricity so that when it comes back, there is zero voltage. Now, what happens when the load is missing? You still have a path and that electricity now turns the wire itself into a load. And what that means is the wire gets hotter and hotter and hotter, kind of like a light bulb until it starts a fire inside your cabinet and burns it down to the ground. So uh, ways that this can happen is if there's something wrong with your part, so an internal fail, or the other really common thing is a short circuit. So that could be any way that the electricity doesn't have to go through the load, yet can jump from positive to negative and come right back. That's when you're gonna have a short circuit and potential fire and a whole bunch of damage. So we are going to use a fuse. Now what the fuse acts like is kind of like a weaker section of wire where if there's something wrong or there's a short circuit and it's asking for too much amperage to flow, then it pops the fuse. And because it's the weakest link, it saves everything else in the circuit. So we need a fuse. Now these fuses come in different shapes and sizes, but they all do the same thing. Now this is a blade style that you'd use in automotive settings and you can get fuse holders for those that work with the, in the line. And for this build, I'm gonna be using these glass type and a fuse holder for it. Now these fuses are rated in how many amps that circuit can take before this fuse pops, preventing any damage. Now the trick is to figure out how many amps we need to have for the fuse. So you have to look at what you're powering up. Now in my case, I have three in total of those 555 incandescent light bulbs. Now each one is worth 0.25 amps. So times that by three, I've got 0.75 amps that's going to run on this circuit. Now there always should be a little bit of a buffer, otherwise you're probably just gonna pop a fuse because you are literally using the current that it's um, gonna blow at. So go up about 20, 25%. And in this case, the next step up that works for us is one amp. Now, besides that, there is a set size. So this is an M5 by 20 millimeter. And so just make sure that you get the fuse holder that matches. Now, this is an in wire or in line style. And how it works is you just undo it and inside here is a little bit of a spring action so that when you put your fuse inside and close it up, 
it puts that spring tension to make sure there's a good contact. And now this wire and this wire is connected because that fuse is in there. Yet if there's any problems, it breaks the circuit, protects the circuit. A couple more things about fuses before I get going on the wiring is you only need one fuse per circuit. It does no benefit to have multiple fuses in one circuit. Now, where you put this is also important. You're gonna to wanna to put it before all the wiring and all the parts that you're trying to save. Now, because we are lighting up a pretty steady power source here, lamps, we can just use the quick blow fuse, meaning that any amperage over that one amp for this is gonna pop it and that's it. However, if you are powering and fusing up something like a gear motor, there is an initial spike in the amount of power right at the beginning when the motor starts, and then it settles back down. So if you use a quick blow fuse there, it'll pop every time. So what you do is you get a slow blow fuse and it kind of allows for that, that burst, but once it settles down, it's okay. Uh, the other thing is depending on your power supply, you may not even need this. The ATX power supplies sometimes have an internal kind of resettable circuit breaker inside. So if there's any problems and it overloads short circuit, it will kick off. And then once the problem resolves, it'll actually turn right back on by itself. So let's get this in now. Now on the end of these wires, you can totally just put a male female spade connector, which is what I'm gonna do in this case, or you can solder them if you're comfortable with that and cover with heat shrink, whatever you want. My And in case I haven't mentioned any of the wires that are running power and not signal, these should be probably minimum 18 gauge, that way you don't have any issues with wires heating up. All right, just so we're clear on the wiring here, I've got a brown 6.3 positive voltage wire coming into the coin door harness uh, where the yellow wires are. Technically, one's a positive and one's a negative, but for these lamps, it really doesn't matter. So pick one of those and then daisy chain it off. And this other one is gonna to go to one side of the button lamp for the launch ball. And then the ground wire comes around the black one and it's gonna go into the other yellow wire that you didn't use yet. That way it gets positive and negative. And then this one daisy chains off and it goes for the other side of the launch ball button lamp. Cool, let's get these 12 volt LED buttons done now. This is gonna be super simple. It's just gonna be taking a yellow 12 volt wire, putting it to the one side of the button lamp and daisy chaining it to the other ones. Take one black wire and put it to the other side of the button lamp and daisy chain them to the other lamps. And then we can test this front side out and see if these light up. All right, so the button wiring is done and that daisy chain has allowed me to just have three wires going up to the front. One for 12 volt, one for 6.3 and one for ground. So pretty cool, less wires, less mess. The wiring is all done. So let's plug this in and see how these buttons look. All right, cool, everything looks great. Now you may have an issue with these LED button lamps not lighting on, maybe not all of them or some of them. And this is an easy fix. Without getting into too much electronic stuff, these LED lamps have something called a diode in it that only lets the electricity go one way through it. So the fix for this dead one is just to shut this off and reverse your connections on the back and then test it and see if it works. Ooh, cool, that was an easy fix. Now, keep in mind that this video I'm showing you just to be able to power up these lamps so that they're just steadily on when the cabinet's on. Later, when I get an LED whiz and the direct output framework set up, then we will get some of these things flashing so that it, they coordinate with what's going on in the game. Cool, let's get some cooling fans in here now. So these pulse width modulated fans are gonna be pretty easy to install, just a couple tips. Uh, there is a spin direction to these when you turn them on, if you're not sure, plug them in and then you'll feel which way the air is getting pulled so that you can position this the right way in your cabinet so that you get the flow you want. Now, I'm also gonna be using these grills to protect people's fingers from underneath the cab or the back of the cab from not going into the fan blade. 
If you're gonna use the same screws to attach all of this, make sure that you position the grill so that it has a little lip up and away from the fan blade so that way it doesn't touch the fan and interfere with that. Now I'm gonna do that on the bottom, but on the back side, I think you might actually kind of see the back. So I'm gonna put this to the back instead. Now, the only thing I'm gonna mention about that is that if you're using separate screws to hold this and separate screws to hold this, they can't be in the same exact spot, otherwise they're gonna hit. So one of these has to get turned. And so what I'm gonna do is turn mine inside the cabinet like that, and then that way the grill can be kind of perpendicular so it looks nice. second pop, this thing screwed in from the backside with little stubby screwdrivers and all that or taking the monitor off, that's gonna be a pain in the butt. So what I did is I found a screw that's long enough to go through the grill, through the wood, and then the screw actually bites into the plastic really well so that'll be able to grab it. And that'll be good for a fan. So I just gotta drill these open, install them. Now that you have your fans installed in your cabinet, the next thing is putting these PWM extension cables and connect that fan all the way to your fan board. Now you can get these in packs like 10 or 20, and all you do is make sure you got the male to female and they only go in one way, and they just click together and you put as many as you need to extend till you get to your board. Now, uh, one other thing, when you go to put this to your fan, there may be two connections. You're gonna wanna connect this extension to the one that has four pins. Uh, that way you have that speed wire, which I believe is the green color. Now, let's take a look at the fan board and see what I got going there. Let's plug in the little speaker for the alarm. And let's plug in the little temperature thermocouple. Now on this fan board, I've got two separate Y splitters so that I can take that pulse width modulation signal and send it to the two front fans. And this one is going to the two back fans. Now, depending on which plug you use, fan one, fan two, fan three, you can have different functionality. And it kind of ties into these little toggle switches on this red block. So let me switch up the angle and I'll show you that. So this first toggle switch is only for fan one. And what it is, is it's determining the duty cycle of the fan when it's running at low speed. So with it off or down, it's gonna be running 20%. With it on, like I have it, it's gonna be running at 40% duty cycle. Now toggles two and three also only refer to the fans plugged into fan one. And what this is, is it's a temperature control kind of system setting here. Uh, with the toggle clamps, you have four possible combinations. And depending on where you leave it, what you are doing is setting the temperatures that are going to kick the fans into 100% duty cycle and try to bring the temperature down to what you have specified. So for example, with these both down, I'm telling the computer that when this thermocouple probe reaches 45 degrees Celsius, the fans are gonna kick into 100% duty cycle until it's back down to 35 degrees Celsius. Um, so you can change these to whatever settings you want. I'll flash a little drawing on the screen so that you know what they do. Right now toggles four and five actually refer to fan one and two. If there is something wrong with those fans and the fan stops working or gets below a certain RPM, this alarm will beep and give you an alarm telling you that you have lost one or more fans. So kind of cool. Uh, however, that's only going to be for fan one and fan two. Now the only other thing I haven't hooked up here is fan three. Uh, there's none of those other functions with fan three. The only thing you can do is change the speed with this potentiometer. All right, I'm gonna show you a little demo with this turned on so that you can understand these functions. You can see the fan spinning. So for whatever reason, the fan stopped. You can hear that alarm has gone off. And if it was to ever fix itself again, the alarm goes off. Pretty cool. Now, the only problem with this is you are only gonna be able to do 50% of the fans. So the other fan here on the front, because the Y cable does not split the RPM to that side, it does not have that functionality. So if I stop this one, 
you can see no alarm. But in my mind, 50% of the fans being protected with an alarm like this, I think that's pretty cool. And then same thing on the back. I'm only gonna get one of these fans with that alarm. Other one just doesn't have it. Now these two front fans have that temperature control. So I'm gonna use a little lighter very carefully to put a little bit of heat in there. And hopefully you can see that the fans are gonna kick into a faster duty cycle. So they spun up and then if I cool it down, it should push back down. So very cool. If this thing gets hotter than I want it to, it'll kick in and try to cool it down. Cool, the only thing left is to wire up our five volt power supply for our future LED addressable strips. Now, these things are so cheap, they literally don't come with an electrical cord to be able to plug them in. So you're gonna have to buy one. Now, if you buy one, they're about $10 online. And when you do that, make sure that they are long enough to get to your power strip and that they have three prongs. You really do wanna have that ground prong uh, to be able to wire this up properly. Now, you also don't have to buy this. I'm sure you have some Something around your house, around your shop that you can just yank and uh, something like a tool that's not working, just make sure it has that three prongs. And I'm sure I've got something around here. Hmm, gives me an idea. What? What the? What? Cool, I managed to find one of these three prong plugs around the shop. Where's my power cord? All right, who stole my power uh, cord? And the other cool thing is it literally has, uh, this was off of something else here with a little like electrical kind of on off switch. I'm tempted to actually just check if this works and use this because if I only use this for the five volt power supply for our LED addressable strips, I now have an on off for all of the strips. That's kind of a cool function. Uh, maybe to keep it simple for the video that I will just kind of hardwire it, but uh, not a bad idea for some functionality to this cabinet. So the wiring on this power supply is actually pretty easy. L stands for live, that's gonna be your black wire. N stands for neutral, which is gonna be your white wire. And ground is gonna be your green wire. And voltage negative, you're gonna run a black wire to our zero common ground terminal block. And voltage positive is gonna be our five volts, which is gonna to go to our five volt terminal block. Now, once you got this wire, double check that that wiring is correct and give it a little tug test, make sure nothing's loose. And there is a little plastic cover here to help kind of protect people from touching this. However, this and all of the different electrical connections that we did, especially the ones that are supplying power, when the cabinet is open, you probably should not have power going on or you have to be very, very careful that you are not touching things like these or any of the live power connections. Otherwise, there's a good chance of getting electrocuted or badly hurt. Very carefully, just gonna confirm that I'm getting the voltages I need. And I have decided to keep that switch because it's already there and it works great. So off, I'm getting zero volts. I'm not gonna have any LED addressable strips and lighting in case I find that distracting or someone does. And then reaching the back of the cab, Flick a switch, boom, LED lighting going on, five volts, perfect. Now something to note about these external power supplies, let's say you've got a five volt and a 12 volt and a 24 volt and you're starting to run out of plug space on your power strip, you can actually daisy chain all of them together using the correct colors on the correct terminals and then you only need to have one plug going back. So everybody is clear about the wiring that I did on my cab, so you guys can do it on yours. 
Here is my zero volts or my ground. So I have a ground wire that comes down through here, runs down this black line. Then it splits with a male and female spade connector and daisy chains up to the 12 volt LED lights. Then it runs along the cabinet and it goes into one of the yellow wires, uh, one of the two yellow wires on the end of our coin door harness. It doesn't matter which one's which because it's a light bulb, not an LED, so you pick either one. And then it splits off there and it goes up to our lamp or on our launch button. And then we've got our 12 volt wire going into our step down regulator. So we have 6.3 volts, which is this terminal block. And then that red wire is actually the inline fuse with one amp. And then that turns into this brown wire here, runs down the cabinet to the corner. And then it runs along here and it goes to the other of the two yellow connections on the coin door harness that you didn't use for the coin door lamps. And then it branches up from there and then it goes on to the side of our lamp. And then we've got our 12 volt terminal block here. We got one that goes to our pulse width modulation fan board to control that. And then the red wire is another one of those inline fuses with a one amp fuse. And that goes down underneath here and turns into this yellow line. And that yellow line goes up to the front here to these coin buttons and daisy chains along those so that we can get power for the 12 volt LED lamps. That's a wrap on another video from Way of the Ranch, this time on how to light up the buttons on the front of your cab and get all your power supplies ready for future stuff like surround sound feedback. Speaking of which, next video up is probably going to be surround sound feedback or it might be setting up our direct output framework system or maybe both, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. You'll just have to tune in and find out. Uh, if you have any questions about what we did today, leave them down in the comment section below and I will get back to you as soon as possible. And if you haven't already, why don't you join us on Instagram and that way you get all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes before the videos are out. Till next time, take it easy.